Well, hello, good evening, and welcome to episode 110 of Humanity versus Insanity, The Crane Report. Now, uh, followers of my morning live streams will know that uh, recently I've spent quite a bit of time in the Northeast, traveling up to support uh, Mark Steele in his um, challenges against uh, Gateshead uh, Metropolitan Council. Well, before I introduce uh, Mark, I just want to uh, flag up the event that's occurring on Sunday, 2nd of December, Democracy in Chains. And I'll be talking a little bit more about this uh, at the end of uh, this evening's broadcast. But uh, here is an opportunity to hook up with like-minded people who are all in the process, at various stages of the process, of either just realizing or taking some very constructive and positive action to try and contribute to bring about the changes that we all know we need to see as we slide very rapidly into a totalitarian corporatist dictatorship. And Mark Steele, my guest tonight, is very much on point in that challenge. And um, uh, recently, and uh, we'll be talking obviously about this uh, through the course of t this evening's program, Mark was in court up against Gateshead Council as they sought to gag him from discussing his concerns and uh, even more so the evidence that he has about the pernicious agenda to introduce 5G and LED streetlights. And of course, this should be a concern to everybody in the country because this issue isn't restricted to Gateshead by any stretch of the imagination. It's actually going to impact everyone right across the country and uh, actually even beyond the UK, but we'll focus on what we can actually influence. So what you see on the screen right now is the um, copy of the hard copy of the uh, local paper there, the Gateshead Chronicle. And the quote in the headline is from Justice Nolan, who uh, uh, oversaw that hearing. And he said, 5G risk must be debated. And he effectively instructed Gateshead Council to treat the concerns being raised by Mark and others seriously and to respond to those concerns and not be dismissive. So it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome Mark Steele on the programme tonight. I think this is Mark's uh, third appearance on Humanity vs Insanity over the last uh, seven or eight months or so. And of course, he was also a speaker at uh, this year's AV9 event. So, Mark, uh, welcome to uh, Humanity vs Insanity this evening. Thanks, Ian. Thanks for having me here. An absolute pleasure. Now, Mark, we have got a lot of uh, material to work through this evening because over the... Um, first half of the show, I want to give you the opportunity to show the evidence which uh, gives you some very real cause for concern that right now, Gateshead is not exactly the healthiest place to, to live in the UK. Um, and then in the second half of the show, we're going to uh, spend a bit of time focusing on the career of the Chief Executive Officer of Gateshead Council, Sheena Ramsey, and I think that uh, um, when people actually see what we have to share about Sheena Ramsey, then I think that uh, they, you know, we'll start, we will encourage them, of course, to do their own research. And of course, I think Sheena Ramsey was much more perhaps concerned about people focusing on her um, than she was perhaps about uh, 5G, but uh, it's going to backfire spectacularly. But, uh, Mark, I think I'm going to uh, share with you some of the quotes that uh, came from Justice Nolan. But, you know, one here is, uh, of course, in the actual uh, printed article there, the quote from the judge he says, I'm not going to give you a gagging order. I'm just going to ask you to behave yourself. So, you know, let's get that bit out of the way first. What did the judge mean by behave yourself, Mark? <clears throat> He basically said that uh, I need to behave myself in, in law, and obviously I'm quite prepared to do that. I'm a great believer in the rule of law, but I'm a great believer in it being applied to everyone equally. I don't believe anybody's above the law. We have a, a very uh, robust, structured legal system, 
a lot of people get rubbed up rubbed up by it uh, in the in the in the wrong way by either not knowing the uh, the the rules of the game, let's say, and it's basically like that to make it complicated. But I think when you do, and obviously we did with your help, Ian, uh, it definitely uh, it, it allows you to uh, get a you know a victory. And, and what we had there, we had a victory for democracy, the rule of law, for freedom, and everything that this country, uh, you know, the reason why they call it Great Britain, because it's great. We had a, uh, a legal system that, uh, you know, when in it, when when in need, it actually uh, it can uh, sort of support the the little guy against the corporate uh, system. Absolutely. Well, you know, I mean, there's no question. It is your passion, your conviction, your commitment to your uh, fellow man, particularly, of course, those who uh, live in the immediate proximity. Uh, that um, actually got you noticed, uh, certainly by Gateshead Council, um, and led them to seek the injunction. And I don't think anyone, uh, including either of the judges that you've uh, been up against in recent days, would, would question your passion, your commitment, your, and your conviction. And, uh, you know, in, in reality, obviously, the, in both cases, the judges simply asked you to uh, effectively how shall I say, um, constrain your, your passion and uh, keep it within the bounds of civility. I'm not going to quote Judge Nolan. Um, of course, it did get a little bit Python-esque with uh, the judge seeing how many times he could use a particular word in the court uh, without the court actually collapsing in hysterics. Um, but hey, that was all part of the, uh, the entertainment. Now, just to, you know, I'm very critical, obviously, of the legal profession on many of... Um, uh, episodes of Humanity vs. Insanity, and it was an absolute refreshing experience to see a judge who, in my opinion, uh, behaved appropriately as a judge should, taking an extremely balanced approach. And uh, I just want to share some of the quotes that um, emanated from the judge's lips uh, on that, uh, that day. So, I mean, obviously, these were taken at random times during the course of the day. But uh, I don't think Justice Nolan left anyone in any doubt that he was absolutely upholding the spirit of democracy and the spirit of freedom of speech. And, uh, you know, here's the quotes. Mr. Steele is entitled to inform the public. I think this is very much in the public interest. I can see Mr. Steele has genuine concerns. I can see Mr. Steele is very knowledgeable in this matter. Freedom of speech is allowed in this country. There is nothing wrong with the defendant's campaign. As long as it is legal, he is just getting up the council's nose. And that, was, I think, was a, a very pertinent observation. He said, I'm not going to stop Mr. Steele's campaign. He just needs to behave himself. And then to a spontaneous round of applause from the public gallery, he stated that this is democracy in action. So, um, you know, Gateshead Council obviously have their own interpretation, which we'll talk about a little bit uh, perhaps later. But I think that, you know, what Justice Nolan was, was doing there was effectively giving you his seal of approval to continue uh, with your campaign to raise awareness of the uh, dangers associated with 5G and LED street lighting. And uh, he effectively instructed, well, not effectively, he did instruct Gateshead Council to take your and other residents' concerns seriously and not be dismissive. So would you say that's a pretty fair summary of the day, Mark? It's a, it's a very fair summary. One of, the, one of the things that he did actually uh, stay on the, say on the day, uh, Ian, was the fact that I was technically competent in law, that means legally qualified. He also stated that the bundle, the science in the bundle, was competent, contrary to Gated Council's uh, legal team. They had actually stated that it was pseudoscience and I wasn't technically capable, uh, which was an absolute uh, a, a disgraceful attempt to blacken my name, my reputation in regard to this technological uh, 
uh, advance. I mean, I know probably better than anyone what 5G is, and that's due to my innovations on the battlefield and battlefield interrogation system, because 5G, unlike the mainstream media narrative of telecommunications, that's telecommunications, all right, but for ATVs, AUVs, you get in between a 5G signal and your mobile device, your new 5G mobile device. Believe us, a brain injury will probably be the least of your of your, of your trouble. So this is not uh, what it says on the tin, I mean, in the mainstream media. If people want to get up to speed about what 5G is, the battlefield interrogation system, it is a target acquiring system. Judge Nolan had all of that evidence in my bundle and that's what allowed him to tell the people in the court that it was, in fact, a criminal conspiracy at Gated Council to roll out an illegal and unlawful technology on the people. Well, hang on a second. Hang on a second, Mark. Let's be absolutely clear. He didn't actually make the observation that it was a conspiracy by the council. I mean, no, I didn't, Ian, I did. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, you did. No, I, let's, let's be very, let, let's actually yeah. hold to the facts. And, uh, you know, let, let's um, uh, uh, not put words into the judge's mouth. I mean, that's, no, no, that's, that's certainly what you could take from his observations. But he was, I mean, he made it clear that he was not a technical expert himself. But obviously, as a judge, he's experienced in, in weighing up the evidence. And over lunch, he made it clear that he would take the time to work through your bundle of evidence. And when he returned after lunch, he made it clear, as you have stated, that he felt that your um, um, skill set, your knowledge, your experience, your expertise was absolutely supported by the scientific, academic and experiential evidence that was contained within that bundle. That's correct. But yep. he also, he, Ian, he also allowed me to make that those statements in that court. Now, what he should have known, well, if he didn't agree with what he'd seen in the bundle, he would have stopped me and he would have struck those comments from the record. He didn't do that. The reason for that, I'm pretty sure what he saw in that bundle was, in fact, the unlawful, illegal, I'll say it again, 5G is unlawful, is illegal. Okay, because let's. Of its design. Yeah, yeah um, absolutely, and that obviously uh, is you know, perhaps the next stage of the the challenge of this process. And this is why it is so, so, so important to nurture curiosity right across the country because this needs everyone to bring whatever expertise, whatever experience, whatever analytical skills they have. Um, because this is not going to be stopped, with all due respect, by one man or one group, just like fracking. You know, fracking is the classic example of community activism, the anti-fracking campaign, that is, not fracking. And, and the anti-5G campaign, the awareness campaign, if it is to be successful, absolutely relies on people being encouraged to take their own curiosity, do their own research, and to come to their own determination as to whether or not they want a 5G phone mast within 300 meters of their house, because that is what will have to happen if the 5G agenda is to be implemented. So now, Mark, we have uh, obviously limited time. So I want to give you the opportunity to work through the reasons why Gateshead right now is arguably one of the least healthy areas of the country in which to uh, to live. And um, so uh, you've got some very specific data, which uh, you've kindly provided to me, and we're going to share that obviously on the screen as we, we work through. But uh, let me bring up the, the first slide. And I'm going to ask you to, you know, we've got a lot of material here, so be as succinct as you can. Remember that, you know, our objective tonight is simply to stimulate people's curiosity. We're not in, in 45 minutes or so going to you know, be able to give them chapter, line and verse. We need to stimulate their curiosity so that they and then they can encourage their, their friends and their family to also look at this because nobody, and I mean nobody, 
is going to escape 5G technology if it gets rolled out. So, Mark, here's the, here's the first uh, slide. Yes, Ian, that's, that, this is a simulation of a 5G uh, mobile phone. And as you can see, there's quite a significant, what we call a lobe. You've got two side lobes there and a rather large, uh, <laughs> looks like it fears the rear lobe sticking out from that phone. Now, that would be uh, pretty safe. However, if you orientate that lobe, uh, it's obviously if you are at the, at the wrong side of the mast in relation to the uh, the signal coming in. Well, it's going out, by the way, from that particular phone, so that's an up, 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 uplink uh, signal. That would at least cause, cause you a significant uh, sort of neurological piece of uh, uh, damage. Uh, and, and obviously, one of the things with 5G, 5G, and let me define 5G for you. 5G is uh, more. It's called densification. One of the main technical parameters of 5G is actually densification. So that's the reason why the 31,875 transmitters on every single streetlight in the borough of Gator is 5G. That's even if it wasn't the specific 868, 870 megahertz frequency for ATVs and AUVs. But it is. So it's a it's a, a target acquiring EUV, E2V, so basically autonomous vehicles uh, sis as part of that spectrum for those vehicles. But as you can see, let's go back to the side loop. This is what they expect people to uh, imagine, right? That signal going through your head, whether it be an uplink or a downlink uh, signal. And I would suggest the downlink signal from the the other technical parameter of 5G, which is a high gain focused dielectric lens, it would be lethal. So, I mean, obviously, it's pretty much acknowledged, even with 2G, 3G, 4G, that the smart thing to do is not hold the phone uh, right up close to your head. In fact, I believe even the phone manufacturers um, in their uh, the, the data that they provide with every phone suggests that you don't hold the phone any closer than two inches um, from, your, from your ear. Um, and of course, the general counsel of advice is to hold it away from you and have it on speakerphone. And I, and I recall an incident um, in Italy where an individual developed a brain, a brain tumour, which was linked directly to his excessive use of his cell phone. I mean, to be fair, his was excessive, but um, you know, nonetheless, it obviously indicates the, the magnitude of the threat. Now here, this slide is the uh, increase in cancer, particularly amongst adolescents uh, in the US in the 15 to 19 year old age group. So you want to talk us through this, Mark? Well, as you can see, you know, brain tumors used to be like chicken's teeth. You, know, you couldn't find them, and now they are commonplace. In fact, as this uh, this document shows, it's the uh, it's the highest incidence of cancers in US adolescents. I mean, and, and you know, in the early days, the technology companies, phone companies, etc., all stated that you know the phones couldn't be that bad because if they were, you would have seen lots and lots of epidemiological data to show that they weren't safe. But guess what? There's the epidemiological epidemiological data there, directly in front of you. Brain cancers, uh, we have had three people in my near locality, unfortunately, horrendous story. Uh, David Smales, whose wife uh, was diagnosed at first with a stroke, collapsed the party, uh, went to hospital, or returned home, everybody thought it was a stroke, as it happens, it was a, a GMB uh, brain tumour, she died. Uh, David was part of uh, the bundle that we had in the court. He was going to appear as a victim uh, witness uh, statement. And unfortunately, David has died of a heart attack in his own home. It's, we were measuring around about 1,300 millivolts, you know, anything from 11 to 1,300 millivolts on average. And she did National Council of Europe 1815 resolution says that 200 in the medium term is uh, is about as much as it should be. So we're about we're near uh, six times over that in in his particular home, and he has a mastered some 
uh, 15 meters from his home. So these masks aren't safe. The transmitters aren't safe. In fact, the transmitters themselves, these high gain dielectric lens antennas, those standards, absolutely illegal. And what I made a point into the court and in the bundle, the legal system is, uh, you know, intertwined with standards, the standard system. And I'll give you an example. If I was to make a plastic tyre, you go down the road, I sell it to you, you go down the road and let's say it bursts and it has been manufactured properly to the right standards, you die, your family die, I'm in serious trouble. These killer technologies do not have any standards. There are a number of guidelines, and I can tell you now, 5G antenna exceed any in a, uh, the IC and IRP guidelines in guidelines that have already been deemed to be absolutely useless because they only apply to the thermal impact, and that thermal impact can only be applied for six minutes. But the 25 milliwatt transmitter we have on the light columns in Gator, 31,875, or on 20,000 a day, seven days a week. Well, one of your witnesses in the injunction case, uh, she made the observation under oath um, that uh, she had lived in the uh, current area for some 30 years and uh, literally in the last few years, coincidentally, in the same period as the installation of the uh, LED streetlights with their uh, 5G sensors on top. And in that period, she had not only experienced a significant downturn in the health and well-being within her own family, but uh, within neighbours that uh, she had known for either all or much of that 30-year period. Ian, we've had uh, numbers of women losing babies. Uh, the, 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 um, the, you know, this, this is absolutely a problem. We've got children bleeding from the nose all over the borough. Uh, we've got, you know, people suffering neurological disorders, sleeplessness, memory loss. This is absolutely appalling. This is a humanitarian crime. You know, I mean, yes, people do believe that I can be a little bit passionate about this, but this is an attack on my countrymen, women and children, and it is coming countrywide. We have central government going now 5G, these high gain, the, what they call MIMO tanks, MIMO massive in, massive out across the country, 400,000 of them. This will kill every pollinator. It will sterilize all the livestock. It will make the land go barren. I mean, what is going on? This is just absolutely unbelievable. And, you know, like I said, you know, you said that on a number of occasions, you do your own research, don't take my word for it. I would just be making this up. I'm not, and like the learned, uh, the learned uh, recorder, uh, Nolan QC, he says I'm technically competent. Well, let's have a look at some of the specific data that you have pulled together on uh, how uh, health trends in Gateshead uh, would appear to be going in the opposite direction to the average in the rest of the country. So, Mark, we have to go through this fairly quickly. Yeah. So um, here, here's the uh, data, um, and this is on the under 75 mortality rate for cancer in Gateshead. So let's um, look at that in full. And, uh, well, yeah, I'm going to bring up the slide and you talk us through it. Well, if you, you see the, the, the little red spots, that's Gateshead. That's the, the, the national trend is all down. And as you'll see, as the installation, because obviously people have stopped smoking, so obviously they're getting healthier. But as you'll see, at the installation date, that second dot, that's the one in, yeah. And as, as, as you see, then all of a sudden there's a spike back up. Now that's the 214, I believe, 15 date. So there's a significant increase. Now, what's really interesting, I've been told that the science that I've supplied to Gateshead Council which shows a significant increase in uh, effects from these microwave radiation uh, pollution because it causes cancer. And, and I've been actually told that this isn't the case. And in fact, it hasn't happened. But guess what? That's the data. This is Public Health England's data. And I can see that there's a significant increase. And here's another trend. 
which also shows an increase from the 14 period up over. So we've had a really, you know, we've had a, a, a great uh, drop in uh, mortality rates over the years. And then all of a sudden we start to see these spikes yep. as of 2.14. So this is, cardi- this is cardiovascular, the under 75 mortality rate for cardiovascular issues. And uh, once again, you know, we see that uh, this downward trend across the rest of the country and in Gateshead, there's uh, an increase there. And we look at this mortality rate from a range of specified communicable diseases, including influenza. Now, there's a very slight increase across the uh, across the country. But that increase is uh, significantly higher in Gateshead. Now, whilst obviously um, you're not suggesting that uh, exposure to to 5G is is a communicable disease, of course, the bottom line is that it's impacting on the body's um, defense system, on its immune system. So people that are exposed to this, uh, this technology are much more susceptible to communicable diseases, including influenza. It lowers your immune system in. Uh, the, the science shows it lowers your immune system, so it leaves you open to all sorts of other uh, infections, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I've, I'm pretty sure that the uh, data that we're seeing here is specific. It is specific to Gateshead, and it is most certainly we have an experimental microwave radiation, an illegal, unlawful microwave radiation transmission device Data speaks for itself. The science is already uh, available. This epidemiological data is only proven up the science. Well, you know, you're accessing a database here. This is the Public Health England database. And if I go back one slide, then you know, people can see here that uh, you know, there is the opportunity on, um, on this uh, database. You can literally select the area, the region, uh, you can select the, uh, the particular aspect of negative health that you want to look at, the trends. And so uh, let's encourage people, particularly in those areas that have been designated as test areas for 5G, which, as we'll see later, is pretty much everywhere in the country. But, you know, this is Public Health England data and, and people need to be looking at this and looking at the trends in their respective areas. Now, Gateshead Council uh, clearly have been looking at this uh, increase in the trend. And by the way, we know that this is uh, also um, occurring elsewhere in the country on a separate programme with Dr. Graham Downing. We, We addressed the significant increase in deaths, uh, particularly in the under 75 age group. So, you know, we're not talking about people just passing as a result of old age. We're talking about people passing as a result of something else, something that uh, is causing them to leave this mortal coil somewhat sooner than perhaps they uh, they should. But Gateshead Council appear to be uh, looking to take advantage of this increase in local mortality. Unbelievable, uh, Ian. Uh, you know, we came across this, uh, the only council in the country to have its own um, so funeral service. Absolutely bizarre. So one of the only uh, councils in the country to have 5G. Still denied it, by the way. Uh, I mean, they're still in denial of 5G, even though when I uh, put it to uh, Sheena Ramsey in the court case, the chief executive, that uh, asked her to define what uh, 5G was, he didn't have a clue. She didn't know what it is, but she, she just makes sure that she hasn't got it in Gateshead. Well, unfortunately, she has got it in Gateshead. It is illegal and unlawful, and the result will be increasing deaths. So I've actually asked Gateshead Council and the Freedom of Information, I want to see that business plan, I want to see the forecasts that they have for this particular business so that we can then address, you know, the, 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 my extreme concern is that someone's planned uh, a business on the back of, but I'll suggest there's growth there somewhere, in and some profit. And I'm suggesting that this isn't a coincidence. 
No, I'm, 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 sure, it, uh, I'm sure it isn't. Um, okay, let's uh, take a look at this. This is uh, hospital admissions um, in the Gateshead and Newcastle area. And um, once again, I mean, this is the national trend. And, uh, you know, we see this significant increase in the Newcastle and Gateshead area. So in 2014, it was basically, you know, on the, at the national average, having been higher, uh, it was on the national average, but now there is quite a marked differential. And this, this data is, uh, you know, two years old. So uh, if we extrapolate this, the likelihood is, and based on obviously your experience in Gateshead, the likelihood is that this gap between the national level and the local level is uh, even greater. Your father died of stroke uh, just last year, Ian. So this, you know, it's, it gets personal. So not only have I had a brother who's lost a grandchild, I've got a father that died and an uncle that died, so of cancer. Father died of a stroke. So this is pretty personal. So you know, when people say that I get passionate about things, believe us, I can get very passionate. This data is absolutely appalling. I was actually told that this wasn't the case. I've actually been told that the scientific data that shows that this type of radiation increases blood pressure, it actually breaks down the blood-brain barrier and damages the brain and actually damages the cellular wall, which obviously would lead to a significant increase in stroke, as we see here. I've been told that my science, the science I've offered to get to council is not correct because they have stated that strokes and stroke level have remained the same. And as we can see by that, that's not the case. My father lived in Gateshead. He was actually uh, sent to a hospital in Newcastle. The hospitals are absolutely bound to the ceiling. People have strokes. Okay, we seem to be losing a bit of the quality on your audio, Mark, for some, uh, some reason. Um, so let's just have a look here. I want to show this graphic here. Um, and, and this is you know, one that you've sent through. How 5G could work. Fifth generation mobile networks could be 100 times faster than 4G. Um, and of course, this is part of the sales technique to get people to uh, buy into it on the basis that they might be able to download a movie a few nanoseconds quicker. But, uh, of course, this is somewhat disingenuous because, actually, the reality is that in terms of what the average user will notice in terms of speed, it's actually going to be negligible. The um, real purpose of 5G is somewhat different. Well, the, the, the actual image of 5G, that's the IEEE uh, definition of 5G. And what that shows is it shows a signal coming from a high-gain dialect lens. So it's a basically a focused uh, signal. That's the real differentiator. So there's two differentiators, 5G and 4G. 5G is densification, so it's more off. So you see those street lights, they haven't got antennas on. In the 5G picture, they do. So that's 5G, it's densification, and it's also a focused signal. But it is also, let's go back to the 4G picture. It is the 4G picture as well. So you actually overlay that 4G with a 5G, and you can see then how what, what's actually happened. Yeah, you've ended up with so much more uh, radiation in your particular area, and it's about overburden. 5G is about overburden of the radiation. So, you know, the, the boil and frog experiment, we've been getting boiled for a few years. The evidence is uh, quite damning, where we've got 70,000 children self-harming in schools. We've got kids killing themselves willy-nilly. It's causing, you know, committing suicide at Bristol University with our 5G experiment. And here we have 5G, which means more. More of 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G. And then you've got these uh, very, very dangerous battlefield interrogation and signal systems where they can actually target a choir because that's what 5g really is it's not you know pull any punches here to target acquiring weapon system well if anybody wanted any doubt about it being a weapon system then it's a case of really uh, look no further than you know this from bloomberg technology back in february uh, where it was bragging that uh, 5g making its global debut at the um korean olympics 
And uh, here's the, you know, the, the tagline, among the first to experience it will be Korea's wild boars because the 5G technology is going to be used to fend off wild boars. And, and of course, this is because it is the same technology as uh, has been used by the US military for crowd control. You can actually shoot somebody with it in the, uh, the two and a half gigahertz weapon that was used against the US embassy in Moscow. It was actually a focused signal and it's no different to the Cuban uh, weapon system. I mean, I know it was reported that it was um, had something to do with an ultrasound weapon. Nobody's going to use an ultrasound weapon because they're big and they break things. So you'd notice it. You know, it would it would break down your equipment. Well, here's the here's the uh, here's the reference to yeah. the um, uh, the Cuba situation. Um, uh, well, it was the uh, it was the U.S. embassy, of course, in uh, in Moscow that was first believed to be targeted by uh, microwave beams, and and then of course the um, the Cubans were accused of the same more recently. But you know, this goes to show that this technology isn't brand new, because uh, here's the the quote from nineteen. 53 to 1976, beams and microwaves, 2.5 to 4 gigahertz, were aimed at the U.S. Embassy building in Moscow. And the article goes on to talk about the symptoms that those people experienced uh, during that period. So, you know, this isn't something new. It's been, uh, these, these frequencies have been used uh, for, um, how shall I say, negative purposes for more than half a decade. And of course, now it is being rolled out right across the country, because this is from uh, Cornwall Live. I believe it also appeared in, uh, in, in, the, in the Plymouth Live version. Suicide fear over weapons grade technology being tested in Cornwall. And um, uh, here's the uh, opening paragraph of this article. A weapons grade new phone technology, which is being tested in Cornwall, is sparking health concerns after a spate of suicides at Bristol University. Cornwall and Cumbria have been confirmed as test areas for the new 5G mobile technology in rural areas. However, a public health professor at the University of California has described 5G as a massive experiment on the health of all species. And there are also fears that the 5G network will require a huge proliferation of new masts with one every 10 to 20 homes, which is the 300 meters that um, is uh, discussed in the University of Surrey white paper. So new organizations, including Cornish Group Villagers Against Masts, have launched campaigns to call for greater security of mobile phone technology and coverage, citing serious concerns over health risks, especially mental health. Now, this test area is being used in pretty much every area in the country. So we've seen this in Dorset, we've seen it in the West Midlands, we've seen it in South Yorkshire, we've seen it in the Northeast, we're seeing it in Edinburgh, in Glasgow. So what's happening right now, the strategy of government and of the corporations is to effectively try to um, convince each area that they are nothing more than a test. It's only a test, nothing to worry about. But of course, that test will quietly be rolled out to be full implementation. And the reality is, of course, that you know people cannot see the dangers of fracking. They know about them because of the experiences of people in the US, in Canada, in Australia over the last 15 to 20 years. And it's also the same here. You know, people, a lot of people, even people that have absolutely got it when it comes to the dangers associated with fracking. Initially, people are going to say, oh, no, you know, they wouldn't. They're going to use the same rhetoric the same dismissive rhetoric as they did when they were first introduced to the concerns over fracking. You know, they're going to say, oh, no, they wouldn't do that to us. No, I mean, it's got to be tested. And then, you know, when either people in their house start to get uh, spontaneous nosebleeds or, you know, insomnia, um, somewhat uh, uh, outrageous lucid dreaming, um, depression, and, you know, then, then people might start to sit up and take note, but by then it could be too late because, you know, the test areas are being rolled out right now. As you've rightly identified, we've seen massive increases 
in suicides in places like Bristol University and York University, lesser, uh, to a lesser extent than Bristol. But, um, you know, is this the case perhaps elsewhere? But certainly Bristol and York have been identified as having spikes in student suicides. And the common denominator is that they were both test areas for 5G. And at Bristol University, I believe there's even a, um, uh, I think it's um, a Nokia uh, uh, test laboratory there. So, you know, Mark, you know, you are absolutely on point here in raising the awareness. And of course, um, you know, you've, you've come right up against the establishment. And uh, fortunately, we had the good fortune that uh, Justice Nolan was appointed to, to hear the injunction case. And, uh, you know, he made the right decision. But what was truly staggering in that injunction hearing was the absolute ignorance of the chief executive, Sheena Ramsey. And what I'd like to do in the um, in remaining um, uh, time of the program is to give an insight into Sheena Ramsey, the lady who is the current chief executive of Gateshead Council. And she's been in that role now for, um, I believe, just uh, under a couple of years. And uh, here was the announcement in the Chronicle, Gateshead Council appoints new chief executive. Uh, Sheena joins from Worcester City Council, where she had been managing director since August 2015. She was actually in that job for about 15 months. Previously, she was chief executive of Knowlesley um, for nearly 10 years, where she led a number of initiatives to increase employment, improve Knowlesley as a place, attracting investment, and bridging about the transformation of town centres through private investment. She was also chief exec assistant chief executive in Newcastle City Council from 1999 to 2005. Now, um, there are people in Knowlesley who have contacted me since I first flagged this up and uh, said that the, their experience of living in Knowlesley during Sheena Ramsey's uh, tenure as chief executive was somewhat less positive than this uh, promo for her in Gateshead really makes out. And here's one article that uh, appeared um, at the back end of, of her tenure at Knowlesley, the making of an education catastrophe. Schools in Knowlesley were dubbed wacky warehouses. And um, it would appear that uh, also she was instrumental, just like many other chief executives around the country, of effectively destroying the high street by uh, increasing business rates, and uh, thereby denying, obviously, the essential uh, commodities of people in the town. And of course, as we've discussed previously, the purpose of which is to reduce the opportunity that people actually have to meet up in person and actually have discussion. Well, Sheena Ramsey, um, was when she quit uh, Knowlesley Council, it was spun as she was quitting to save money. But uh, she has a very interesting uh, definition of saving money because this is from the Liverpool Echo in uh, July 2015 and the observation that she walked away from Knowlesley or was helped on her way with a final pay package of £330,000. In fact, it went on to say that uh, her departure was ironically meant to save the council money but she received £332,581 last year in 2015 in pay, pension contributions and a very hefty redundancy package. Now, she then moved on to Worcester and uh, the announcement in Worcester was made about um, a month before that article appeared in the Liverpool Echo. And uh, here she was... Um, she took a cut in salary, which she could afford to, couldn't she? Because she'd just taken 330-odd thousand pounds from Knowlesley. And uh, so she took a pay cut and she was appointed as managing director of Worcester City Council on a salary of 105,000. And here's the uh, statement here. It says, Sheena Ramsey, a well-known figure on Merseyside, where she ran a huge council for nearly a decade before quitting last year, has beat off more than 40 other candidates to secure a top Guildhall job. <clears throat> well, somebody either didn't do their research 
or she was uh, somebody was instructed that she should be shooed in to this job in Worcester. Well, she wasn't in the job for very long, but um, it appears that uh, there were some problems because the Worcester Observer, which stated that she was uh, a year or 15 months after the announcement that she was taking up the position, announced that she was going to stand down. Now, <clears throat> it says here that Mrs. Ramsey will leave at the end of February 2017 after a 16-month spell at the helm, which began in August 2015. The outgoing managing director said she had taken difficult decisions with heavy heart and explained the move was for personal reasons. I will be starting a job in the northeast of England where I'll be closer to my family. Well, it seems that um, uh, there were some concerns and a guy who uh, identifies himself as Mike Fagan submitted a number of freedom of information requests. And uh, you can find what I'm sharing with you. It's in the public domain. It's on a website called whatdotheyknow.com. And Mike Fagan wrote in, on the 24th of June last year, uh, he said, Dear Worcester City Council, Judge Annabel Pilling of the First Tier Tribunal has issued an astonishing judgment that finds Worcester City Council guilty of deliberately withholding information relating to allegations of corruption against the council's former managing director, Sheena Ramsey. In her scathing ruling, she dismisses the council's evidence as not a credible explanation and pours scorn upon its explanations, dismissing its supposed investigation into Sheena Ramsey's corrupt activities as far from thorough. And she is not satisfied that an adequate search or investigation has been conducted. Judge Pilling has ruled that the council has withheld information and ordered that the council must now release the information relating to the corruption allegations that it has unlawfully withheld. Well, it would seem that Worcester City Council, despite being instructed by a judge to release that information, has uh, decided that that isn't going to happen. And um, in fact, here's um, the response from Worcester Council. It says, uh, Dear Mr. Fagan, I'm writing to you in connection with the various information requests and complaints that you have made to the City Council relating to unsubstantiated allegations against the City Council's managing director. The purpose of this letter is to advise you that the Council will not engage in any further correspondence with you about this matter. The Council's position is that the matter is closed. In other words, basically, um, the Council have effectively refused to be drawn despite a judge ruling that Worcester City Council is um, uh, um, not behaving appropriately by withholding this information from being released into the public domain. So if you want to find out more about the corruption allegations against uh, Sheena Ramsey, then go to this website, whatdotheyknow.com. Um, it's very simple, create an account and uh, ask your own questions. If you have any concerns about uh, Sheena Ramsey's um, dealings at Worcester or Knowsley or at Gateshead, then the appropriate means to uh, get information revealed is to use whatdotheyknow.com, where your, um, your application for the information will be immediately in the public domain. Well, meanwhile, uh, obviously she's been in the job at uh, Gateshead for 18 months now. This was the Chronicle um, uh, article that appeared upon her appointment. Gateshead Council hire new chief executive to steer authority through the tough years. Well, um, you know, Mrs. Ramsey acknowledged that the challenge ahead saying the next few years would be tough, but of course not for her because she's on a salary of £160,000. Um, she went on to say the next few years will be tough, but I'm confident Gateshead's excellent track record for service, delivery and innovation. We will realise the vision for Gateshead. Well, the vision for Gateshead is to destroy it, to destroy all of the civil society, civil services, um, because this is the agenda that uh, is being pursued right across the country. And, you know, when I looked at Sheena Ramsey's track record, it smelt of common purpose. And sure enough, what do we find? That uh, Sheena Ramsey is indeed a graduate of common purpose. She attended the common purpose um, uh, indoctrination program in 1992, 93. 
uh, in Edinburgh when she was the support and services personnel manager for Scottish Courage Brewing Limited. So no real surprises there. And if you, I doubt many of you watching this are hearing about Common Purpose for the first time, but if you are, here is um, an article from uh, almost a decade ago now where the BBC asked whether Common Purpose was a secret society. Whereas there are more than 20,000 people identified as the next generation of leaders have attended its courses. But if you're not one of them, you've probably never heard of it. Well, in the inimitable words of George Carling, it's a club and we ain't in it, fortunately. Well, that article goes on, it says, uh, according to one Common Purpose graduate who spoke to the BBC, Common Purpose's, Common Purpose's activities seem innocent enough. Delegates attend a week-long residential program where the emphasis is on personal development and making new contacts. She said delegates were encouraged to identify their strengths and weaknesses and were taken on outings to a psychiatric hospital, a prison, and a local tenants association in the city. <laughs> so make of that what you will. What have they taken to a psychiatric hospital and the prison and basically told <laughs> that that's where, that's where you'll end up if you don't actually follow our agenda. And by the way, if you do, you will be extremely well rewarded. And Sheena Ramsey has indeed been extremely well rewarded because since 2015, she has taken £950,000 minimum in compensation and benefits from her appointments in uh, Knowlesley, Worcester and Gateshead. And of course, this is the lady behind Common Purpose. I use the term lady loosely, uh, Julia Middleton, uh, who uh, founded this um, organization. This is from the Mail Online. This non-profit organization is like the left's very own old boy network. Well, I'm sure, like I said, that the vast majority of people watching this tonight are very familiar with um, Common Purpose. But uh, those who are not, then do take a look at the excellent website, cpexposed.com, commonpurposeexposed.com, or simply put Common Purpose Exposed into your search engine and uh, be prepared to uh, be truly shocked by what you find there. And much of that is thanks to Brian Gerrish's outstanding uh, investigation, which he started now some 15 plus years ago. And, uh, you know, people are still coming out of the woodwork. Well, I'd also like to um, direct you to an episode of UK Column News. And this is uh, UK Column News on the 14th of August of... Um, of, of this year. And in this episode, uh, Mike Robinson and Brian Gerrish have a look at Ofcom and they look at Ofcom's role as the poster boy for 5G. Ofcom is supposed to protect the consumer. That's the role of Ofcom, to protect the consumer from the cavalier practices of government and industry. Yet, Ofcom seem to be acting as the marketing consultants for 5G. And I would absolutely recommend that you are put a link underneath this um, episode of Humanity vs. Insanity, and I would recommend that you watch this particular program. So where are we heading? Well, <sighs> we are heading for collectivism. And this is a long-term agenda. And um, I know that some people still don't want to believe it. But here's what's occurring. We have the neoliberals neo where, you know, over the last 30 years or 40 years or so, we've got to a crazy situation where chief executives of the um, uh, top global corporations are now earning, on average, 347 times the amount of the average employee. You know, 40, 50 years ago, it was about 40 times. This is how outrageous it's become as the wealth of nations has migrated into fewer and fewer pockets, or should I say offshore bank accounts. At the other end of the spectrum, we have debt slavery. So what we have at one end of the spectrum is neoliberalism, i.e. absolute liberty for the wealthy to do as they wish, to literally treat humanity as a commodity. And of course, they even tell you that that's the case by calling you human resources to be used, abused, and discarded on a whim. And at the other end of the spectrum, to make sure 
that uh, these guys are never threatened, then they make sure that basically everybody else is effectively kept in abject debt slavery. And you know this is going to be the theme of Democracy in Chains, AB9, on Sunday, December the 2nd. And, you know, I think more and more people are starting to realize the magnitude of the problem, which means that those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom are starting to realize that they're getting backed into a corner. But of course, that's when things get really nasty because a cornered rat won't just concede, they'll come out fighting. And, you know, for those who have been following my work over the past uh, 15 or so years, will recognize why I latched onto this article. This is an article that appeared in The Guardian uh, about a week ago. It was written by Brooke Harrington, professor of economic sociology at the Copenhagen Business School and author of Capital Without Borders. And the article was titled, The Bad Behavior of the Richest, What I Learned from Wealth Managers. Well, the quote in this article that caught my attention, and I say uh, those who are familiar with much of my research over the past 15 years will realize the significance of this observation. The clients of this Geneva-based wealth manager also believe that they are descended from the pharaohs and that they were destined to inherit the earth, i.e. those who believe themselves to be the rightful rulers of a planetary fiefdom, wrongly. But is humanity going to roll over and uh, just condemn future generations to abject economic slavery? Or is humanity going to do the right thing and challenge this totalitarian global corporatocracy? Mark, you are on point here. 5G, the LED street lighting are integral parts of the control mechanism. And if they are successful in getting this rolled out in 2020 stroke 2021, then my observation is that it is going to be exponentially more difficult for future generations to shake off the chains of the corporatocracy. Yeah, yes, Ian, the, the 5G system will kill everything. It's an existential threat to the environment, to humanity, and to the economy. I, I actually class it as economic terrorism. Now, there's obviously a lot of people out there who think, you know, it, it, might, it sounds like a good job, but it's spy on everybody. I can tell you now, from what we're seeing in gear to the increase in the death and mortality rates, Optical radiation, the thing I know quite a lot about, I, you know, I came from microwave radiation as a bit of a, uh, uh, I didn't think it was a game, this is what it was until I spoke to uh, 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 Martin Black, Professor Martin Black at Columbia University, who uh, educated me a little bit on this, unfortunately, uh, Martin died now. Martin was actually directed me to a piece of equipment uh, in the head of this, well, head of the space system and it, it actually showed me how dangerous this technology was so the optical radiation from the LED streetlights believe you me will kill everything it's pulse modulated it's as dangerous as the 868 the phased away system and believe you me people need to wake up get out there and get out there and you know stop this sitting on the hands uh attitude, you know, where you leave it to somebody else. Let's all get, you know, organized. We are the resistance. We've woken up. We need to wake everybody else up. Okay, well, hey, Mark, I'm only just going to challenge you on one point. We absolutely do not need to get organized. Quite the opposite, because the establishment knows how to deal with an organized opposition. What we need, just like the anti-fracking community, we need to evolve community activism and take it to the next level. Community activism is about individuals, small groups, interested parties and concerned individuals doing whatever they believe appropriate to challenge this obscenity. Because that way, 
The establishment has no idea where the next challenge is coming from. The establishment wants to work with NGOs. They know how to work with NGOs. They know how to manipulate NGOs. They know how to present their conversations with NGOs as though they are discussions with the wider community. They are not. Every community needs to get on this case. Every community needs to challenge their parish, their, their district, their county councils. Unfortunately, phone masts have become permitted development. So it's not easy to stop phone masts just manifesting. But if they manifest near you, and particularly if they manifest near a school, then you need to do your research and look at the implications on the health of your children or any other children attending that particular school. So as we come, I believe, very close to ending fracking in this country, unfortunately, another challenge appears. And whilst I understand that some people might want to take a break from getting involved, we don't have that luxury. If you have any concern about the health and well-being of future generations, then please do your own research and look at the negative health science of 5G and LED streetlights. Mark, thank you so much for joining me this evening. And uh, I know, obviously, you're going to take the battle to a whole new level. And uh, hopefully we're going to see that challenge manifest all around the country. And as I know, it's starting to manifest elsewhere in the world. Thanks for joining me this evening. Thank you to my guest, uh, Mark Steele. And uh, I will be back in a few weeks with another episode of Humanity versus Insanity.